The 19th century, oft considered to be the zenith of European cultural achievement and industrial novelty, a time of fine art and music, but also of war and great political upheaval, a period known both for its decadent wealth and dire poverty. But while newly unified nations grappled with one another for continental dominance, a sickness internal spread through the hallowed halls and exuberant ballrooms of the European elite, a plague that would come to claim the lives of over 3,000, a plague which could kill at the ballet or in the middle of a ball, a plague called fashion. <laughs> June 6th, 1867. Her Majesty, the Archduchess Matilda Marie Adelgund Alexandra of Austria, prepares for an evening attending social events, including a trip to the theater. From Van der Groven, Catholic Princess. She was 18, and by now her father, the Duke of Teschen, had already arranged her betrothal to Prince of Sardinia and future King of Italy, Umberto I. In a quiet defiance against him and the societal pressure she faced each day, she had picked up a habit of smoking cigarettes, a habit which would eventually lead to her early demise. As a member of the House of Habsburg, she was burdened with the task of keeping up appearances, often changing four or more times a day. By the 1860s, the fashionable silhouette had reached its amplest point in the century, with a tightly corseted waist opening to a colossal cage crinoline, often more than 12 feet round the hem. Tight lacing, or the process of lacing the corset to its snuggest, most restrictive size, was still in fact done by some fashionable ladies of the period, despite its already widely publicized health drawbacks. The cage crinoline was a necessary construction to achieve the huge skirt, while relieving the wearer of the burdens of half a dozen petticoats, as it was in the previous decades. However, it also created a perfect funnel for flames to rise and grow should the dress catch fire. This was compounded by the unwieldy size and shape of the crinoline's hoops, and the highly flammable fabrics that were oh so desirable for the fashionable ball gown of the era. The same kind of ball gown the Archduchess Matilda would be wearing this very night. The Victorian ideal of beauty had, throughout the century, been unusually partnered with death, from arsenic green to tuberculosis chic. Still, the Archduchess would not realize the extent of the dangers until it was far too late. Have you heard back from the Prussian front yet?
Frau Adelgund. Smile for das Kamera. One, two, three. Before entering the theater, the Archduchess decided to step away and calm her nerves with a smoke. So, when she heard her father approaching, she hastily put the cigarette out on her skirt. Her entire gown was engulfed in flames in a matter of seconds, thus ending the tale of the Archduchess Matilda. But she was not the first, nor the last, 19th century celebrity to go up in smoke. November 15th, 1862, Emma Livry, accomplished, graceful, the picture-perfect image of a romantic ballet performer, the toast of Paris's burgeoning ballet scene. She appeared to flutter and float across the stage in a diaphanous, ephemeral skirt of highly flammable cotton, tulle, and gauze. Fireproof skirts had, however, been made available years prior. Why might she have chosen not to wear a safer costume? On her deathbed, she said the following of these fireproof gowns. I would never think of wearing them. They are so ugly. She would die in the hospital of her burns. Her corset melted to her skin. Meanwhile, in the United States, Suffragist and temperance advocate Amelia Bloomer was in the midst of a fashion revolution. While not necessarily the original creator of the new Bloomer pants, which were intended as a more healthy alternative to the absurdities of 19th century fashion, she was indeed responsible for the Bloomer's publicization and spread, hence the name Bloomers. While Bloomer dress quickly fell from favor in the States, it did, along with even more dress-related deaths, spark a conversation across the Western world about dress reform. Oh, guten Tag. Hello, my name is Gustav Jäger, and I am a naturalist from Germany, and a um, uh, dress reformer, and dress reformer. As a scientist, it is my expert opinion that dress reform should not be done through changes to the corset or the skirt, but rather in the material in which these items of clothing are rendered. Uh, I found in my experiments people are most fireproof in wool. However, when they are clothed in woven materials or vegetable fibers, why, they are practically torches ready for the lighting. Of course, every revolution has its counter-revolution, and rational dress was no different. There were a great many critics of dress reform, with a great many things to say on the matter. Ah, oh, bloomerism, a ghastly American custom. Whatever happened to half a dozen petticoats and just as many children? Matrons were matrons in those days. Does Miss Amelia Bloomer intend to make all young ladies old maids? You know the old ride? At 15, a little pet. Twenty, a sweet coquette. At forty, married yet. At fifty, a suffragette. Are you interested in joining my society of matrons against rational dress? Despite its critics, rational dress prevailed and, by the end of the century, had begun to be widely adopted. <laughs> Why, your skirt! It has split drawers! Why, it's a cycling skirt! But you don't even own a bicycle! No, but I do own a sewing machine! <laughs> Why, it seems you've adopted blues yourself, Eliza! Oh, naturally! They're simply so convenient! Although, I must admit, it is accompanied by dreadful gossip for my sewing circle. Oh, well, I never! In fact, I am reading the newest gazette of the Rational Dress Society. The Rational Dress Society? Yes. 
The Rational Dress Society protests against the introduction of any fashion in dress that either deforms the figure, impedes the movement of the body, or in any way tends to injure the health. It protests against the wearing of tightly fitting corsets, of high-heeled or narrow-toed boots, and shoes, of heavily weighted skirts as rendering healthy exercise almost impossible, and of all tied-down cloaks or other garments impeding the movements of the arms. Well, is that what Amelia Bloomer has to say now? Oh, why many women are adopting rational dress? Why, I suppose they are! <laughs> <laughs> And so, by the start of the 20th century, people had dropped the crinolines and flammable fabrics. And yet, deadly fashions persisted, and continue to do so to this very day. From the tripping hazard hobble skirts of the 1910s, which also coincided with the rise of the automobile, <coughs> to radium cosmetics and botched plastic surgeries. You know what they say, beauty is pain. And some people want to look drop, dead, gorgeous.